Today we're going to talk about Maine's Ice Age history and our uber-condensed uh, unit due to circumstances beyond our control on climate change. And we're also going to talk a little bit about global climate. Um, it's kind of a crash course format. We're doing kind of the greatest hits of this unit. So we're going to talk about what's called the surficial geology of Maine. So that means everything that's on top of the bedrock. So we're no longer talking about tectonics, things like that. All the stuff that happens on top of it. And we're going to talk about these huge ice sheets that used to cover much of North America. A lot of what we know comes from ice cores. So these are cores that are taken generally on ice sheets. So we're talking uh, places up in Greenland and Antarctica where you core down into the ice and you retrieve old ice dating back hundreds of thousands of years. Um, you're out here in these tents uh, working long hours in the sunlight uh, 24 hours a day. Now, these can provide us both global and local information. So when snow turns to ice, I mean, that's how we make a glacier in the first place, you have really, really uh, light snowflakes that fall down, and over time, their outer edges uh, get deformed, they get compacted. So eventually, that snow that falls each year gets turned into ice where it traps air bubbles. So these air bubbles are really important because what they do is they trap the atmospheric conditions from the time at which this snow fell and eventually formed into ice. And you can even see annual layering inside these ice cores here where you, where you get a little bit of melt on the top of it and then more compaction down below and it creates these little bands here. So in a glacier, as you go from the top to the bottom, the snow gets older, gets turned into fern, which is like a corn snow, and then eventually it gets turned into dense glacial ice. So the information we get from Greenland and Antarctica uh, will tell us both local and global info. The local info, if you look here at what's called deuterium isotope temperature proxy, you can look at the actual isotopic content of that snow and that ice and that will tell you at the temperature at which it formed. And that's a very local piece of information. But if we talk about atmospheric conditions, that's much more global. Okay, so we can look at the amount of carbon dioxide in these cores over time. And if you look at this one from about 400,000 years to present, we can see the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And when it was really, really high, this is what's called an interglacial time. This is when things were warm. So you see it's warm here, 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 and then right here. Note where our current level is, though, due to man-made contributions. When you look at the levels down here, about 180 parts per million, this is when you get a mile of ice over Boston. So when we talk about temperature change, the temperature anomaly, that means the departure from a normal average, is actually not that huge from what you might expect. So this 8 degree difference is the difference between Maine and Boston, like I said, ice being all the way out to New York um, and being totally covered versus conditions similar to now. So if you look at our global temperature anomaly just for the past oh, about 1500 years, you can see there's not much of a deviation here until you actually start running into 20th century warming here. When you see instrumental record, that means that's from uh, direct measurements of, of temperature versus these other things that are called proxy-based reconstructions. These are using different things like tree rings or ice cores or sediment cores to infer what past temperature was like. So one thing that we know is true is that whenever CO2 is high, whenever methane is high, whenever these nitrogen oxides are high, we are going to get higher temperatures as shown from that those isotopes. So if I were to color in here in red, this is a time of an interglacial, kind of like now. Same thing here, same thing here, and same thing here. Versus these times that look down here, I'm doing it in blue, these are glacial periods. These are periods when you've got continental scale glaciers over much of Canada. Poor Canada. Um, and what happens is what are called nonlinear feedback loops, where if the sun shines down upon the earth, if you remember from the video last time, it then gets bounced off the earth and re-reflected back down by these greenhouse gases, CO2, nitrogen oxides, and methane. And what this does is it melts more snow, which causes darker land or water to be exposed, which heats up the planet, which melts more snow, and then it kind of spirals from there. 
So greenhouse gases are often the things that push the tipping points uh, towards something either being a glacial or interglacial period and are overwritten on top of those astronomical features I talked about before. So we study glaciers today to understand how they work now and in the past so that when we take a core, we can understand what it is that we're actually looking at. So this is a picture I took up in Svalbard. We'd use these stakes to determine how much the glaciers melted or gained. Um, we take temperature measurements of weather station. Here I am working on a weather station there so that I can understand, okay, what does the ice look like based on this year's temperature in live time? And we even go out and we measure the streams that are associated with that glacier to see how much melt is coming down into the uh, ecosystem. We dig to understand the permafrost, because in the permafrost, you can see Hannah's really happy that I was uh, digging this for, and that permafrost, it has a lot of stored carbon in it. So if the permafrost melts, so permafrost is just ground that's mel that is frozen for uh, all year long, if that melts, it releases that CO2 out. And what that does is then triggers even more warming on top of it, which melts more permafrost, and you see kind of where it's going from there. And we also take cores of different things other than ice to figure out what's happening on land, uh, what's happening in the ocean. So this is up in Norway, a rather long core we took right there, where at the bottom of this you can get down 10,000 years. So we can look at even fine layering in lakes here in Maine. This is one in Basin Pond up in Fayette. Whoa, whoa, what is, sorry, oh, I don't know how that got in there. So for evidence of glaciation here in Maine, um, we can look at our landscape in a lot of different ways and figure out what is the history of this giant Laurentide ice sheet. And I think it's important for you to know because it's literally telling us the story of the ground beneath our feet. And this was at this extent around 25,000 years ago. It's generally somewhere between 24 and 28,000 years when there was a large, large glacier and we we're kind of near the margin of it that came out and uh, was dropping icebergs here into the Gulf of Maine. So the story is as follows, okay? When the glacier was at its maximum extent about 28 to 24,000 years ago, it was down here to like Block Island, Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, and Long Island is even one big old bulldozed ridge of dirt that came from that huge ice sheet, and this marks the extent of ice. Now, when the glacier was down over the land here, it pushed down on that crust, and we know that the lithosphere rides on the asthenosphere, and so that when it started receding back, what happened is the water followed the glacier back. And then eventually the ground then rebounded back up after the ice was long gone and it dropped sea level back down again. So what it did is it created this thing which is called marine limit. What marine limit is, is that's the inland extent of the ocean here in Maine. So this line shows us all the area in our state that was underwater about 14,000 years ago. Um, and that's a pretty remarkable thing. When you walk around the state, this whole area was submerged. So if you've got clay in your backyard, there's a good chance there could even be shell fragments in it that could be carbon dated to be seen that they were about 14,000 years old. So this is that hard, dense clay uh, that you really don't want to be gardening in, but it's remnant of when this area was covered by ocean. When you look at giant boulders, if you see all of these scratch marks, and I'll uh, indicate them here in red, all of these scratches are places where this boulder was dragged underneath the ice sheet against the bedrock. If you look here, these are not from the excavators. This is from the weight of a glacier that was the size of all of Canada. If we look at something called geomorphology, so this is just basically how our land looks like here in Maine. This area right here, I've blown up over here, and using LIDAR, where, where you've got sophisticated light detection and raging, uh, basically lasers shooting through even the vegetation to be able to see what the actual ground looks like, you can see that all of the land in this area is oriented in this direction. Because when the glacier came through here, what it did is it scraped along the bedrocks uh, uh, during in this area, 
and created these streamlined features here. And this is how the glacier moved in this direction from Canada, oops, I'll draw this in here, from Canada all the way down to the coast of Maine. So when you look at what's called a simplified superficial geologic map of Maine, um, this shows what all of the material is that's on top of the bedrock, all of the loose material uh, is in the state of Maine, and most of it's this green color. It's what's called till. So this till is the stuff that is deposited at the bottom of a glacier, like a knife with butter being run over toast, basically. It is smeared onto the landscape, and this till is renewed every time there's a glaciation. So it turns out in the past 400, 700,000 years, there's been a glaciation about once every uh, 100,000 years. And every time that happens, we get brand new till, brand new soil that looks like this from Canada. Thanks, Canada. Um, and this is the stuff that is not sorted out. What it means is that it's all different sized particles. It's classic New England rocky dirt. And if you look at this pink stuff, Wherever you find that is where you're able to draw this line of what's called marine limit to tell us, oh, the only way that this stuff gets deposited is if it was covered up by the ocean at one point. So, that should just, oh, man, what, huh, weird. Uh, anyways, I can, I can get rid of that. Um, no, no, this thing's, wow. Uh, so, thank you guys for watching, and I hope... All is well. Take care.